Hey, thanks to CS Medical for sponsoring this episode. CS Medical's T-Clean Automated TEE Probe Cleaner Disinfector is designed exclusively for transesophageal cleaning and high-level disinfection of ultrasound probes. T-Clean provides both manufacturer's recommended cleaning and high-level disinfection of soil TEE probes. T-Clean automates this enzymatic soak, significantly reducing the handling of the delicate transducer of the TEE probe, thus further reducing the chance for damage. You're listening to The 5 Second Rule, brought to you by APIC, the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology. Together with our nearly 16,000 members, we strive to create a safer world through the prevention of infection. Join us while we talk to infection preventionists and other experts to learn the truth about some common myths related to the risk of infection and to get tips to keep yourself and the people around you safe from infection. So Sylvia, question for you. Mm. Would you say that your apartment is a hotel clean or a hospital clean? My apartment is probably somewhere in between, I confess. I do have a cleaning lady, though, and she comes every two weeks. Okay. I I would probably say, actually, I don't want to admit whether or not mine would even be hotel clean standards, but we're going to talk about on today's episode of the five second rule, we are going to discuss really what it means of how clean is clean enough. I'm Hannah Andrews. And I'm Sylvia Quevedo. Welcome to Apex podcast, the five second rule. We are thrilled to have Frank Myers with us today, all the way from California, Frank has certification in infection control, and he's a fellow of APIC. He serves as the Interim Director of Infection Prevention and Clinical Epidemiology at the University of California, San Diego Health. Hi there, Frank. Hello. How are you? How's things? Things are going quite well. It's another beautiful day in Southern California. As always, as always. Frank, This episode is all about what is clean, what's clean enough. We use those terms in healthcare. We use them with friends, family. We go to hotels. We really want to distill down what's clean and how we clean. Can you share with us some information about what you think of clean in the infection prevention community? Well, you you used a couple terms there. You used the term clean. And generally, I think everyone's definition of clean is pretty close. That is, it's you look at something and you say visually, this is a clean surface or visually, yuck, it's not. Um, then we start to use other terms such as, has the surface been disinfected? Um, so that's, uh, people may think of uh, certain products as claiming that they kill 99.9% of viruses and uh, bacteria. That's kind of disinfecting the surface. So not just physically removing dirt, but also killing it. And then we go all the way to a standard called sterilization, which means we've not only, we've killed everything, not 99.9%, but we've actually killed everything and the potential for some things that may not technically be alive to come to life on the surface. So that's, that's the definition of sterilization. And I think whenever, we use these terms, oftentimes we use them interchangeably when, in fact, in healthcare, they're not. Okay, so Hannah asked earlier, you know, is my apartment hotel clean versus hospital clean? I- I'm going to go with no on both counts. <laughs> but let's talk hotel clean. So for our public out there, there is a certain level, a certain expectation that you check into a hotel, two-star, three-star, four-star, all the way up to five-star, you're expecting it to be at least visibly unsoiled. Is that a fair, would would we say that that's fair? That's my standard when I go to a hotel. <laughs> I want it to be visually clean. And there's a lot of traffic that comes in and out of a hospital, or not of, of a hospital, a hotel, although a lot of hospital as well. And so we're going to touch on that in a second. I want to note something for those that travel frequently, whether you are terrified of staying in hotels and you bring your own sheets or you bring your own cleaning materials. I know a lot of people out there, including myself, I sometimes bring my own pillowcases, definitely, uh, is 
there was a study done, um, the American Society of Microbiology touched on it a few years ago. It was done by a collaborative effort between the University of Houston, Purdue, and the University of South Carolina, and they took NASA-level analysis methods. So we're talking about as sterile as humanly possible is what NASA is trying to achieve in their in their station and their various um, their various areas. And they noted some pretty common items that are going to be the dirtiest that maybe housekeeping isn't touching on. So you're talking about your TV remotes, those light switches. But what they don't, what I think people forget is what the housekeeping staff is bringing in and out of those rooms. So there aren't always items that are just remaining in the the wiping really quickly is they have a single cart that is going from room to room that includes the same sponges, mops, cloths, cleaning equipment, and what is basically colonized on each of those items that they are bringing from room to room. And so I, that was sort of an odd piece for me that I didn't really think about. I mean, I know, you know, sponges are kind of gross. You want to throw those out as often as you can. But what does that mean from a hospital perspective? Because you, there is housekeeping in a hospital. You have your environmental services team. Who is really doing that? What is involved in that room-to-room cleaning, disinfection, sterilization process? Well, it's very different than a hotel situation because obviously our patients, our people in our facility are a lot sicker and have the potential to get much sicker if we don't do a good job cleaning. So the first difference really isn't about what goes into the room, it's what's already in the room. So when you walk into a hotel room, the first thing you'll see is usually a beautiful carpet. Um, And that carpet's there. And the one thing we know about carpet is it's almost impossible to clean. Uh, So right off the bat, you have an uncleanable surface. If you walk into a hospital in the United States, the vast majority of, of hospital rooms will not have a carpet in them. For that simple reason, it's very, very difficult to clean and it's almost impossible to disinfect. Remember, disinfect is that term that we use whenever we start killing things. So it's easy to run a vacuum over it, suck up some of the bacteria, some of the the, the funguses that will be in the carpet, but you're not really getting a kill in that setting. In a hospital, on the other hand, what we do is we basically get disinfectants, which are specially designed uh, for the environment then we make sure that they're compatible so it doesn't break down the surface. The example I always use there is, um, you know, stainless steel, it's pretty to look at. If you take bleach to it, you're gonna destroy the stainless steel. You're gonna get a pitted section. So we in the hospital actually have to sit down and say, hey, is this disinfectant compatible with this surface? So we do that. Um, Then we actually come up with lists of things that are in the room. And that's kind of, each patient has different medical equipment that uh, they have used on them during the stay in in the hospital. Um, And one of the questions that frequently comes up is, who cleans what? And nurses clean the room a fair amount and nurses assistants do a fair amount between what we call environmental services, or we shorten that to EVS. Um, So the EVS people are the ones who do the deep cleaning, and they will do a general cleaning on a daily basis. The one thing I noted you talked about was with the hotel rooms, the remote control. We call that a high-touch surface. So we spend extra time looking at high-touch surfaces in the room to make sure those are cleaned more diligently than, than the other spaces. Frank, I want to ask you a question. We hear from our infection preventionist members, um, and you're a member, so this will be familiar to our members and to other healthcare workers, but one of the challenges we do here is understanding the different surfaces that, in fact, do exist in a healthcare setting and the importance of matching the disinfectant product to the material and also following those important directions or instructions for use. I know that, uh, and maybe you're going to get to this, but it really is important to read the directions. And if you need to soak something or what I believe is called the wet time, because remember, a lot of our listeners are healthcare workers in across the gamut, doctors, nurses, therapists, techs. Can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of the different So as you stated, 
um, let's let's deal with contact time, and then we'll 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 get to um, compatibility. So, contact time is uh, the amount of time that a disinfectant has to be on a surface in a wet state um, in order to get the claim that it can kill bacteria, viruses, fungi. Um, so, in in these cases, um, oftentimes the shortest you'll get uh, is usually about a one minute contact time uh, for a surface. So that means you have to keep it wet for at least a minute. I don't know anybody that does that in their house, uh, but yet that is the routine um, in healthcare today. We also, as, I, as you stated, we need to follow the instructions for use. So some um, devices say that they can only have certain chemicals used on them and you cannot use other chemicals. So a chemical that we frequently use in healthcare is uh, quaternary ammonias. Um, we call them quats for short. Um, and quats uh, can come into contact with certain surfaces and degrade them. Uh, one of the challenges we have in healthcare is we use more and more touch screens uh, with our computers. And if you put some quaternary ammonias on a touch screen, it can actually crack it. Um, or make it ineffective. So we've been challenged with how to clean these surface areas uh, and, and go from there. Also, the role of the device uh, plays a major uh, decision as to how we clean it or reprocess it. So here, so, can I stop you, Frank, and yeah. just make sure that we're clear. So there are the high-touch surfaces. Sadly, we've all had occasion to go to a hotel uh, a hospital room correct and there's the doorknob there's the bed rail there's the what do you light call light switches and the tv remotes just like in a hotel exactly and those those tables so uh -huh. those are those high touch surfaces then you've got the curtain we haven't even begun to talk about fabrics and some porous of surfaces exactly yeah. but frank you're talking about devices and just to clarify we're talking about medical devices Okay, yes. so for example, uh, for example, you can have everything from a, um, a blood pressure cuff, which basically comes into contact with your intact skin. So it's kind of like using somebody else's shirt. You want to make sure that it's clean. That person doesn't have any problems, and it should be a fairly cleanable surface, intact skin to intact skin. Then you have something. Um, like uh, a scope that we probably, as, as we've gotten older, I think all of us have had a colonoscopy or been told at least we should get one. Well, Hannah um, hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in that club, though, full disclosure. We'll, we'll but yeah, but we're that. all adults here on the five-second rule. So medical devices that enter and our bodies. Come in contact right. with mucous members. If we're following the right. Spalding classification, which I believe is what you are discussing, we have the non-critical, yeah. semi-critical, critical, and that semi-critical, that scope, is it is in contact with a mucous membrane. Um, right. And I think you're about to get into the critical stage. Yes, I am. So we, we have those, those first two, and we clean those in two different ways, and then we get to critical items, um, and these are items that are going to be entering sterile tissue. Uh, so the body, once you kind of get past our skin, is very vulnerable to infections. And in this particular case, going in uh, to the skin, you want something to be sterilized. And that means, again, that not only is it free of all bacteria, viruses, and, and fungi, but also it does not have any spores on it that theoretically would be able to sporulate at a later time and cause an infection. Okay, so we've got our members on there like, yeah, yeah, we know this. But this is still a challenge in healthcare settings. And we're talking primarily of acute care, but there are challenges in long-term care facilities where a resident's room is their home. It's not the hospital. Uh, there's home health, there's outpatient facilities, you know, we all go to the doctor and there's that funny piece of paper. I don't know what that's doing on where you sit and get examined. But, <laughs> but talk to us about the challenges. So we know there's cleaning, there's 
disinfection, there's sterilization, and yes, folks, we can get even more granular and talk about low-level versus high-level disinfection. Steam sterilization. And all of that. We're not nece- we could do five shows on this. But Frank, talk to us about the challenges in healthcare. Talk to us about what infection preventionists are doing with their healthcare colleagues. Can you share some of the challenges and what the public can do to sort of make things better? Well, the challenges, I think, are multifold. Uh, the, the first one that I always worry about is, does everyone understand who's cleaning what? And I, I mentioned this briefly before, where literally, because there is so much unique medical equipment that goes into the room, in some cases, the nurse can think that someone's cleaning this part, and she says to me, gee, Frank, the nursing assistant always cleans that. And I go to the nursing assistant, the nursing assistant says, EVS always cleans that. And I go to EVS and EVS, those are the, the, the environmental service people who clean the room and they say, I never clean it. It's the nurses that clean that. And I go to the nurses and the nurses go, no, it's the nurse assistant. So we can see no one's cleaning that particular device because no one's ever set the expectation. So to actually go into a room and spend time with people and saying, hey, here's what gets clean and here's what doesn't get clean. That's one challenge. Um, The other challenge happens to be uh, the amount of time that we have to turn a room around. Uh, If you can imagine, you have a critically ill patient waiting in the emergency department uh, to get a room so that in the IC intensive care unit um, so they can get uh, life-sustaining treatment. There's a little bit of pressure there to quickly get that patient up into an atmosphere that's more supportive than the emergency department. Nevertheless, we have to make sure that that room is adequately clean so that that patient who gets up there isn't at risk of getting an infection because we've done a poor job of cleaning the room. So you would ask the question also, what role do I think um, the uh, visitors or the patient themselves play in making sure that the room is clean? I, I, I would, I've actually gotten phone calls from friends who happen to be in the hospital and they, they taken pictures of things and said to me, Frank, look at this. Does this look right to you? And I'll look at it and go, no, that's definitely not, doesn't even meet the standard of hotel clean. (laughs) Um, And and basically it's then pointing out to the staff, hey, this this doesn't quite look clean to me. Uh, People were always sharing with me how they're afraid that the hospital or the healthcare worker is going to do some sort of retaliation if you point out that we're human beings and make mistakes. And I want to tell you that in any healthcare organization, sometimes people react defensively, but there will never be retaliation. No one got into this job to make patients pay. We all got into the job to help patients. So we're always grateful whenever errors are found so that we can do a better job. Well, I think one thing I want to touch on what you just said is we were talking about also those visitors. And one thing we try and say on pretty much every episode is infection prevention is everybody's business. So, you know, we have the the turnaround potentially more consistently with acute care. When you go to your general practitioner, let's say you think you've come down with the flu and you're sitting in the waiting room. Well, you don't see anybody cleaning that every minute, every five minutes, there is a little bit of onus on you. There's sometimes a box of of masks. There is hand sanitizer probably all over the waiting room. And with those particular settings, I believe, in, and Frank, correct me if I'm wrong, you are relying heavily on the nursing staff because EVS is really, or the environmental services team, it's very similar to um, to think of an office where you don't see the cleaning crew until around 5 p.m. It's really an end of business, close of business situation. So who's cleaning it during the day? And so I think it's important for you as a visitor to acknowledge what that really looks like in reality and what you can do to ensure that if you are feeling ill and you think, OK, I've got a fever, I'm not feeling so great and I'm in a room potentially exposing healthier people to something that I may have, what can I do as an individual to make sure that I'm helping to keep my surroundings clean? Yeah, we, we have a fancy name for that, which is point source control. Uh, and basically what it means is we want you to kind of keep all of your secretions with you. So that means <laughs> good respiratory hygiene whenever you sneeze or cough. So if you cover um, those 
we, we, we refer to them, uh, you know, colloquially as goobers. Um, if you keep your goobers from flying all over the room, that means somebody doesn't have to worry as much about cleaning it. And there's less of a chance of transmission to the next patient who happens to sit in that uh, cloth chair that uh, is right next to you that you may have sneezed on. If you don't sneeze on it, less chance of transmission. So remembering to cover your coughs, your sneezes, et cetera, so that you can minimize um, that, that space. And uh, that, is, that is truly a critical role. Frequent hand hygiene. Um, in this way, we, we always kind of laugh that infection preventionists are a, a, a little bit different than my mother. So when I was I was growing up, my mother used to always uh, tell me if she caught me picking my nose that I should go wash my hands. And now that I'm an infection preventionist, I know the real risk is you should actually wash your hands before you pick your nose. <laughs> <laughs> you picked up all kinds of things from the environment, and so you will just be auto-inoculating, uh, just basically carrying the virus into your nose where it can replicate very well and cause a cold or the flu. You heard it here, folks. Do not pick your nose. Or rub your <laughs> eyes after you've been touching lots of things and... But, you know, it is interesting, and I, I started to say at the beginning of the episode that I did not realize the complexity of clean. You know, it's, it's, you mentioned something that's visibly soiled, but a lot of times you can look at something and it is colonized, it's full of, remember, the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses, they are naked to our eye. And mm-hmm. so it is important for everyone, and especially our, our healthcare colleagues, to understand the importance of proper cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization. You know, it's not enough to wipe something with a cloth. Right. Would you say so that's it, correct? Yeah, that's, that's definitely correct. So we use um, a number of ways to actually test in the healthcare environment whether we've been effective at cleaning. So one is a kind of uh, a powder that glows under UV light um, or a a fluid that glows under UV light. We'll apply it to a surface. And uh, the other way we can do it is using um, a a device that actually tests for the presence of live or or dead bacteria or viruses. Uh, And uh, my story that really drove home the importance of mechanical action or just we call it, you know, uh, elbow grease um, to clean a surface was we were beginning to train our EVS staff. um, And by the way, Frank, let me just clarify. EVS is our housekeeping staff. They're critical, so important. So shake their hand and give them a high five because they're so important in our healthcare settings. So, yes, the housekeeping staff were were getting trained using this this UV lights and, and powders, et cetera. And I watched one of our housekeeping staff. She did a great job. She got every surface. She cleaned everything and definitely was making sure that the contact time, the time in which the disinfectant is is needed to be wet and to get a kill was complied with. And And she did just everything right whenever I was watching her. And we turned on the, uh, UV light after she finished to show any areas that she missed. And she actually missed most of the room. And I was stunned because I'd seen her apply a rag to all of it, you know, and what it turned out was she just wasn't using enough mechanical action to remove the dirt. And so it just stayed there. Um, And it was, it was an impressive learning lesson for me because it really drove home the fact that you can't really see how well something is being cleaned unless you've got a way to test for it. I think all of us have had the experience of going to the grocery store and uh, grabbing a hold of the, 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 the grocery cart and all of a sudden feeling that stickiness that comes on the, gro- the grocery cart. That, that's actually a biofilm. Now, it clearly looked clean whenever you touched it because you wanted to put your hands there if it looked dirty. But the second you got that sensation of that stickiness, you knew it wasn't. And so it is a matter of knowing that the problem we have is just with the naked eye, it's almost, you can only tell if something's dirty with the naked eye. You can never tell if it's truly a safe surface. Well, I think that's something that bringing back to our, our general public listeners, that we are very, very guilty of, of cleaning our own homes. I think we focus so much on visibly clean that just returning to items that we talked about earlier in regards to that contact time, 
the number of people I would love to know that actually read the instructions on the back of the bottles, whether it's for the bathroom cleaner or just a general surface cleaner. I think that we focus so much on, oh, let me get that one stain out of a sweater or the sofa because I spilled food on it when really I'm thinking, do I need to wash my sofa? Or, you know, I think the also the kitchen countertops, when you think of, I mean, kitchens and bathrooms, those are definitely going to be more microbial incubators than potentially any other area in your home because they have a lot of exposure to direct pot body contact. So think of the surfaces in there. Exactly. And moisture, humidity. There are all these factors in your environment that are contributing to how these microbes are living on these surfaces. So when you think about the next time you spray whatever, I don't CLR or any of those sort of Windex or any of those cleaners that whether it's on your window or different surfaces in your bathtub or in your kitchen countertops, read the instructions on the back. I know you so badly want to scrub. I know uh, Frank was talking about that earlier. Don't immediately scrub. It's meant to sit there for a reason. So even though it might look clean, it just looks wet, if I'm being honest. Don't wipe it. It doesn't. Get, it's just dust that you're getting rid of if you wipe it instantly. You're not actually letting those potentially porous surfaces actually kill or eliminate what's living there. True. True. And I yeah. think a minute is a long time. A, a, a minute really is a lot is. longer than you think it is. It yes. really is. But like you said, everyone's trying to do the right thing in healthcare. This is not to in any way point fingers or blame. There are just inherent challenges with, as you said, getting room rooms ready for very ill sick patients the there there's pressure among our colleagues to clean things quickly and i know there are efforts underway among many organizations including apic uh there is i will um this is sort of i guess it's in press but don't quote me on this so don't don't call um or email us but i will share that the centers for disease control the cdc's Healthcare Infection Control Practices Advisory Council, affectionately known as HICPAC, um, they do have a paper coming out. Frank, I don't even know if you're aware of this, on the core strategies of environmental cleaning and disinfection for hospitals. And it speaks to some of these issues around addressing staffing, right? Because we know right. our EVS or housekeeping staff, you know, the minute – Budget cuts sometimes turn to housekeeping cuts, but they're so critical. What can we do about, to your point earlier, making sure everybody knows who's cleaning what? So that paper is forthcoming, but are you aware of some other efforts to mitigate the problems that we've talked about? So I, I think uh, one thing that we are doing better and better each day is really training our EBS staff. When I started in this job uh, well over 25 years ago, we would basically tell people, you know, hey, clean the room, and we'd watch them one or two times, and that would kind of be the end of that particular story. Now using, a, you know, I was talking about the luminescent technology or uh, other technologies that Tech, check for the presence of uh, virus and bacteria after a cleaning has occurred. We're able to provide feedback back to our housekeeping staff. And the other thing is we're able to pretty quickly figure out whether or not a surface is cleanable. I think all of us who have used uh, some of the uh, technologies have seen that we ourselves cannot clean certain surfaces that we thought previously we were able to do. Uh, you've got some surfaces where they add a little bit of 3D texture so your hands don't slip whenever you're handling it. That sounds like a great idea until you actually try to clean that 3D surface and then pretty quickly you realize, wait, this isn't a cleanable surface anymore. Maybe we need to go with a different product. And so all of those are, I think, making a much safer healthcare environment because we are spending more time with our housekeeping staff and uh, been able to make a big difference. There was, uh, uh, there's been a few studies which have actually shown that in today's healthcare environment in the United States, most of the patient's infections are actually coming from the patient's own bacteria uh, because we are doing a good job of actually cleaning the surfaces. So the, all of those are, 
are definite wins and definite advancements. That's not to say we still don't miss things and we still don't have outbreaks associated with poor cleaning. Those do happen, but it, it's it's definitely an improved uh, area, really even within the last 25 years. Okay, so Frank, how clean is clean enough? Well, there's two important variables that we look at. Um, the first important variable is uh, what are we going to be doing there? And how often are people going to be interacting with that environment? So in OR, you're going to want to have a pretty clean area, certainly above the patient. If you don't want any bacteria falling into an open surgical wound. So that has a very high standard for cleaning. On the other hand, uh, you can look at a x-ray area where we're just taking x-rays of patients. That area may have a bunch of patients go through, so you want some level of cleanliness, but it doesn't have to be crazy. The second variable that we look at is what are the risks? And we talked about kitchens. Um, and so you've got a bunch of different bacteria in kitchens that can pose a risk. And some of those are very scary uh, because they have a very low loading dose. You know what a loading dose is, don't you, don't you Sylvia? Uh, I don't. Do you, Hannah? No, I don't. For me, it's about four shots of tequila, but that's not important right now. <laughs> now, loading dose is the number of bacteria or viruses you need to get into the body in order to cause an infection. So oh, there's, right. there's, yeah, there's one particular bacteria, Shigella, one bacteria can make you sick. Now, we were talking about surgical wounds earlier. You need about 200 colony forming units of bacteria in order to cause it. So how clean is clean enough? It all depends on what you're doing and what potential bacteria or pathogens are there. Now, Frank, within each of our episodes, we have a what's bugging you section. We like to ask what each of our guests, what's bugging them about the topic in which they're speaking on. So in this case, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization, a clean environment, I believe, or a healthy microbiome. Um, so. Frank, can you speak to what's bugging you about cleaning, disinfection, and sterilization? Well, I, I, I think uh, I, I've kind of alluded to it already, which is there are a lot of medical devices uh, that have hit the market, which provide life-sustaining or life-changing um, or life-saving benefits, but unfortunately were never designed to be cleaned. Uh, and I think, again, if you if you look at some of those, we know uh, some of the endoscopes, which are scopes that we use for colonoscopies and other type procedures, uh, which enter the human body. Really, when they were created, not a lot of thought went into how are we going to clean this once we're finished with it? All of the thought went into how can I get better visualization of this part of the body when we're using this device? And because that was the focus, Unfortunately, it resulted in a device that simply cannot be easily cleaned. I, I want uh, you know your viewers to think of an endoscope, which is basically a tube which enters uh, an orifice, uh, and it has little channels in it that we can run medical instruments through. And we tell our staff who clean those, you run a brush through it, run the brush through until it's clean. But those people can actually spend 20, 30 years cleaning those scopes, but they've never been able to see inside them. So if you can imagine trying to clean something in, in your house and you put a blindfold on before you clean the house, that's a pretty tough task to expect that house to look beautiful whenever you're finished with that cleaning. But yet we say that to people who are reprocessing endoscopes and they say, well, you know, you're not going to be able to see inside the endoscope, but I'm sure you're going to do a good job. It's a pretty challenging request to make of somebody. Well, thank you, Frank, so much for joining us today. I'm, I want to leave a few things. I'm just going to leave a few things. IFUs, instructions for use, applies to both the healthcare workers and general public. Read those instructions unique to each instrument, each device, as well as do some research on ice machines because that's a whole other story. Yeah, that'll be another episode. Thank you, Frank, for joining us. Thanks to our listeners. And for more information, be sure to check out APIC at APIC.org, where we have lots of great information. Thanks for listening to The Five Second Rule, produced by the Association for Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology staff, including Hannah Andrews, Sylvia Covedo, and the APIC Communications Committee, in partnership with Human Factor. Audio tech is Blake Alfin.